tonight. Navy SEAL and author Carl Higbee talks about his book, Enemies, Foreign and Domestic, and what the obsession with political correctness and egalitarianism will mean for our ability to defend our country. I mean, if you had flat feet, you couldn't get in. Now they've, they've relaxed not necessarily the physical standard, but the criteria in order to make the cut. And then what's happening is, is these guys, still great men, women, are going through training, and now they're getting hurt in training. And Anthony Gucciardi and Dr. Group warn us about the silent killers in the workplace. We hear about the cesium, we hear about the strontium-90, we hear about the iodine, the radioactive iodine. The problem is no one really knows when they have radiation poisoning. Then, a special report from Alex Jones. The globalists want to conquer the world, but they know that tyrants have always fallen. So they want to short-circuit common sense and short-circuit the family and any type of fealty where people are territorial and stand up for themselves. So if we learn anything from Fukushima, when the plant operators and the Japanese government said everything's fine, everything's safe, and the independent studies found that 1.5 times at least the amount of radiation was actually released from the plant and 70% was drained into the Pacific Ocean of the cesium, it's that maybe we can't always trust the plant operation groups, the corporations, the for-profit corporations, and even some of the oversight committees that are supposed to look at these plants and make sure everything's safe, make sure they're not leaking. And it's mainstream news, CBS News, you name it, that about 75% of nuclear sites now are leaking tritium. And this obviously is a radioactive component. The nuke sites around the world, but especially the United States, are leaking, period. It's an issue. No one wants to talk about it. The corporations that are running it all don't want to talk about it, and they don't want to have the liability, so they're saying it's fine. It's totally safe. All these sites around the world that are full of radiation, don't worry about it. It doesn't even exist. And uh, that's not okay with me. It's not okay with Dr. Group, who's been researching this for 20-plus years. And it's not okay for any of us, because we actually have to talk about these issues. We can't pretend everything's fine. We're not the for-profit corporations behind this, and we're actually going to discuss what's really going on. So, Dr. Group, thank you. It's uh, always fun to sit in here and talk with you. So, what's going on with all the nuke sites that are leaking around the country? Well, Anthony, it is really sad that we have a toxic substance that we can't feel, that we can't see, that we can't taste, that is one of the most toxic substances known to man, and that's radio isotopes that are damaging to our cells, damaging to our body. And we have some of the worst scenarios right now around the world. Look what happened with Fukushima. I mean, Fukushima has been a disaster. It's been a cover-up. One of the least talked about radioisotopes is tritium. I mean, we hear about the cesium, we hear about the strontium-90, we hear about the iodine, the radioactive iodine. The problem is no one really knows when they have radiation poisoning. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost a slow death. The research that's coming out right now, though, is alarming because tritium is a really, the best way to explain it is it's radioactive hydrogen. <clears throat> it's not like a cesium or some other element that if it gets in your body, it might go to the thyroid gland or it might affect the bones. The scary thing about tritium is it is legal for these nuclear power plants to produce and release tritium into the air. And they use it in the cooling system, so they use it in water. So you know water is a component of every living substance. Our bodies, everything that's alive is composed of at least 80% water. So tritium, because it is radioactive hydrogen, is easily absorbed through the air, so you can breathe it in. You swim in tritium-enriched waters, you're gonna soak it in through your skin. It's now getting in the soil and the plants are sucking it in through the water. It's scary because tritium actually affects the DNA inside your body, so it attacks every cell's DNA. It's not located in one area like other radioactive materials. So it's something that I wanted to bring the attention to, to everybody out there, because if you live in a 200 mile radius, let's say, of some sort of a nuclear reactor or nuclear power generating facility, most likely you're being exposed to radioactive materials. And doctors are not trained to diagnose people and say, hey, 
you know, we have all these tests that we can take a blood test or we can take saliva test or we can x-ray you, which is damaging in itself, and determine that you have radioactive poisoning. So it's almost like a slow death and, and people need to be aware of it and protect themselves from any type of radioactive substances that they might be exposed to on a regular basis. It's a crazy thought. And I don't think that, you know, there's people just dropping dead from radiation poisoning or something from these plants, but the concept that they're just releasing things kind of unchecked and that 75 plus percent nuke sites are leaking tritium or that uh, I also saw that CBS and other agencies said, yeah, they're just kind of leaking, period. And there's something being done to fix them, but at the same time, it's such an industry that is so specific that most people aren't even researching. They have no idea what's going on, uh, let alone, for example, people really finding out about Fukushima. It's become a huge issue and people are learning about it. But the percentage of the population that actually looks into it and actually does something about it is so small that these nuke site plants and even the Fukushima uh, TEPCO operators can kind of get away with whatever. Like, let's say there is a leak and it's going into the groundwater. They can just say, oh, it's totally fine. You're totally safe. And there's an instance we're going to talk to Joe, uh, one of the producers around here, too, about what happened with his family. I mean, there's nuke sites that just leak and they have disasters and they sit there forever. No one wants to pay to clean it up. No one wants the liability. And then people get sick, uh, you know. And that's the other thing, too. It's hard, isn't it, to say, oh, well, this, di you know, this nuke site leaking actually caused my health problem, right? Just like everything else. It's all slow stuff. Like when you eat food that's crap, you eat the pesticides and the garbage in the food supply, and 20 years later you get cancer. It's, there's links to it, obviously, but you can't say, oh, that sausage I ate 20 years ago gave me cancer. So the liability is kind of like, oh, it's not that. It's, you know, it's just, it's magic. <laughs> None of that affected you in any way. It's, it's. It's wild. What do, you, what do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, we've been able to identify the majority of the toxins that are out there, and we can pinpoint, for example, what mercury does to the body. We can pinpoint what aluminum does. We can, you know, there's studies out there that show what genetically modified foods do to the body. No one, this is like the secret underground killer that no one's talking about, that everyone's afraid to talk about, and there's no solutions or no way to really track the fact that what this is doing to every single individual out there. I don't even think it's, I mean, I think people that live near nuclear power plants are one thing. They're at extreme risk, especially their children. But we have a global situation right now. Fukushima, for example, is dumping millions of tons of water that's laced with tritium into the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> Yeah, they, the study found that 70% of the original cesium from the explosion went into the Pacific Ocean. Right. I mean, you're, yeah, but then you're, they say it's fine. They say it's totally <laughs> not, it's totally fine. And, you know, I don't know all the specifics. They did find some radioactive stuff in the United States, obviously, right? But then they would say, you're crazy if you think it's an issue, if it's going into the oceans. There's nothing in the oceans that are dying from the 70% the of cesium that went into the ocean. And there's like weird um, mutations around the site and stuff, but it's, it's fine. I mean, do you think anyone actually believes that? Everything's fine. It, this also ties into, by the way, if viewers are watching and they're like, these people are crazy. They're saying that everyone is dying from radiation poisoning. We're not saying that. We're saying this is one of those slow underlying things that's actually contributing to health problems that no one's talking about because everyone's afraid to discuss it because the corporations that are running this don't want to talk about it because liability, as we said a million times. And then also because the oversight committees and stuff, they don't want to blow up some huge story. Nobody wants a big scandal. This is real life, though. And if you're in a fairy tale scenario where everything's fine, Fukushima's fine, it didn't do anything, it didn't leak into the ocean, uh, TEPCO has it under control, sending in, they didn't they hire homeless people to go in with like duct tape and stuff? Uh, the <laughs> robot they sent in to fix Fukushima died because of the high radiation levels. It's <laughs> total insanity. But if you talk about it, that's bad. Everything is actually fine. You're right, if anyone's a doubter, you're right, it's totally safe. Let the tritium just be released into the air. Everything's fine. <laughs> do you think people really believe that, though? Do you really, do you really think that? You know, I, I, you know, it's our job to identify the type of warfare that's going on against us, and that's how we protect ourselves. I mean, you have to learn math to be able to do your finances. So, 
I think that there still are a lot of people that just don't want to believe what's going on in the environment. There's also at the same time a lot of good that's happening in the environment. How do you create change good, in the yeah. world? And you know, you call it warfare too, not to interrupt. But to some people it might mean, oh, well, do, are the nuke people actually just trying to kill us? No, I don't think that's, the, that's what we're saying at all. We're just saying that it's just like if you were running a business and you're making tons and tons of money, but you found out that one of your products was hurting people, okay? If you're a greedy, horrible CEO person or whatever, uh, you don't care. You don't want to spend the extra five pennies. Like, let's say a fast food company doesn't want to spend five pennies extra per meal or whatever to enhance the quality and the ingredients of the food. They're like, no, I'm, that's, that accounts to $10 million a year or whatever. I'm going to keep that money. You don't want it to get out that the ingredients in the food are actually harming people. And eventually it might come out and they might have to actually do something about it and it costs them money. So that's what it is to me. It is we are suffering because of greedy people's decisions because they don't want to lose the cash. They don't want the spotlight on them. You know, so essentially it is attacking us, whether it's regardless of the motive. I think it's just they don't want to have uh, the financial expenditures to deal with it, you know, or they don't well, want to deal with the government Well, it does actually oversight. come back, back to money because I looked yeah. into that and nuclear power plants are extremely profitable. Once they're up and running, it's pure money coming in. They know that they're dealing with compounds, radioactive compounds that could take millions of years to, you know, that they're going to have to hold in special types of cells and everything like, you know, to protect against leakage. The problem is that's going to cost them a hundred times, a thousand times more money than they're making from selling the power from the nuclear yeah. power plants. So it is, it's, it's, First of all, we should have oversight. The, our government should be protecting us, and just but the word nuclear just itself. Instead, they're build more. Right now, they more. just want to keep building and keep building and keep building. Let's get out of the technology a hundred years ago, and let's move into Tesla's technology or free energy technology that we've had and that's been suppressed since the 1950s, and move to a clean sources of energy that we can use without any damage, environmental damage, or human damage in the future, because that's, we're going to be dealing with this our whole lives, and our kids are going to be dealing with this, and their kids are going to be dealing with this, unless miraculously we figure out a way to neutralize these right. spent nuclear rods, it's going to be a concern for a long time. It's just one more of those things where you take something that we really don't even know the full implications of, the full impact of, like the way we ma manipulate so much stuff and we just blast it out and just hope it'll be okay, and there's not much oversight. And what's funny is I would be for nuclear power if they had clean, sustainable systems. They weren't leaking everywhere. There wasn't Fukushima, Chernobyl incidents. All of that is just playing poker with a really, really bad hand, just hoping, well, if we can produce the energy and make money for now, it's worth it in the long run. When you could, I've read articles from professors saying it'll be a 100,000-year nuclear nightmare for, from Fukushima. Just Fukushima. Yeah. You know how many plants are leaking and on, on the verge of real issues? It's just so absurd. So, well, thank you very much for that research, and it's always fun to be invited uh, as a guest here on Nightly News to chat. Dr. Group, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Anthony. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, well, I'm Anthony Gucciardi. I'm always excited and happy to be invited as a guest host on the InfoWars Nightly News. Now we're going to take you to break. It has been nicknamed Chernobyl on the Hudson. Lying just 34 miles north of New York City's Central Park, the Indian Point Energy Center has been leaking the radioactive material known as tritium into the groundwater. On February 6, 2016, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo finally alerted the public as to the potential catastrophe. Better late than never? In 1973, the plant was shut down after engineers discovered buckling in the steel liner of the concrete dome in which the nuclear reactor is housed. On October 17, 1980, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission proposed a $2,100,000 fine for an incident involving 100,000 gallons of Hudson River water that had leaked into the Indian Point 2 containment building from the fan cooling unit, undetected by a safety device designed to detect hot water. Two pumps which should have removed the water were found to be inoperative. In 1984, the New York Times reported that 25% of the young fish known as the Atlantic Tom Cod and 89% of the old older Atlantic tomcod inhabiting the Hudson suffered from liver cancer. These mutated tomcods had evolved after GE dumped PCBs into the Hudson River from 1947 to 1976. 
In 2005, Entergy workers, while digging, discovered a small leak in a spent fuel pool. Water containing tritium and strontium-90 was leaking through a crack in the pool building and then finding its way into the nearby Hudson River. In 2007, a transformer at Unit 3 caught fire and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission raised its level of inspections. In April of 2007, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission fined the owner of the Indian Point nuclear plant $130,000 for failing to meet a deadline for a new emergency siren plan. The 150 sirens at the plant were meant to alert residents within 10 miles to a plant emergency. In 2009, an International Journal of Health Services study revealed that residents living on the Hudson had a 67% higher thyroid cancer rate than the national average. In 2010, an explosion occurred in a main transformer for Indian Point 2, spilling oil into the Hudson River. Entergy later agreed to pay a $1.2 million penalty for the transformer explosion. In July of 2013, a former supervisor who worked at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant for 29 years was arrested for falsifying critical safety records and lying to federal regulators. In June of 2015, a Mylar balloon floated into a switchyard, causing an electrical problem resulting in the shutdown of Reactor 3. In July of 2015, Reactor 3 was again shut down after a water pump failure. On December 5th, 2015, Indian Point 2 was shut down after several control rods lost power. Obviously, Indian Point could potentially be a repeat of the, at the very least, Level 7 Fukushima Daiichi disaster if a nuclear meltdown occurs due to a hurricane or other natural event leading to equipment failures. However, a similar disaster would require the evacuation of 5.6 million people and render Manhattan a no-go zone for decades. In 2004, a study by the Union of Concerned Scientists estimated as many as 44,000 near-term deaths from acute radiation syndrome and as many as 518,000 long-term cancer deaths could occur in people within 50 miles of Indian Point in the event of a severe accident. So it's one thing to read the studies in the news and all that kind of stuff about the nuclear reactor sites and what it's been done to uh families and everything like that, but to actually hear someone's personal story is another deal. And the technical director of the Nutley News, Joe Jennings, is in here with me right now along with Dr. Group, because he grew up and worked next to a nuclear disaster site. And he's going to share the full details, but he has a very, very sad story about what happened to a family member of his that he thinks is related. And also, it's pretty insane how now they're building houses on the old nuclear site. They didn't clean it up. And the people who are buying the houses there have to sign waivers saying, oh, everything's fine, you know. And he's got a lot to share. And Dr. Group is here because he's been researching this for over 20 years. And we're going to get his take on it as well. So, guys, thanks. And as always, I'm excited to be a guest host tonight and talk with you guys. So, Joe, tell me exactly, to bring people up to speed, what happened, where you grew up, and what went on there. So, I grew up in Thousand Oaks, California. Um, went to high school there, everything like that. My father worked in that area. Um, it is just, I would say, northeast of Simi Valley, the Santa Susana Pass. I also worked in Simi Valley, right? I, I could look at the Santa Susana Pass where they were testing rocket engines. You always knew they were testing because your house would shake. That's where they tested most, most of the space program's engines for the shuttle, for any kind of rockets. It was called at one time Rocketdyne, owned by Rockwell International. Now NASA bought it. Now Boeing owns it. So it's, it's changed hands over the years. But in the 1950s, that's where they had a Site 4, which was several nuclear experimental nuclear reactors. Those were put next to the rocket engines and stuff like that. They were doing all kinds of testing there. Do you think anybody knew that there were experimental, other than the workers, experimental nuclear reactors right there in their neighborhood. Nobody knew. So basically what happened was in 59, the reactor broke and started building up giant amounts of radioactive gas inside the reactor. It was going to melt down like Chernobyl. And of course so, they didn't tell anybody. No, they didn't tell anybody. They said, open the doors and let the gas out for weeks 
while they were fixing these reactors, open the doors, let the gas out. Well, in the Santa Susana Pass, that's a very windy, that's where a lot of airflow from California goes through. It, it goes through one way, it goes through the other way, it gets uh, pushed by the coastal winds. So it's like putting a, uh, spraying toxins in an air vent. So all those toxins went all over the areas into Topanga Canyon, into Northridge, large, large, huge areas of people. That was on one side. Now you have Thousand Oaks, Westlake, Simi Valley, farms, Santa Paula, all these are farms. These are, these are, these are crops that we eat every day from strawberries to tomatoes to oranges, avocados, huge swaths of land because the soil is rich. Mm -hmm. so, so, so tell me what happened when you were growing up in the area, your first-hand experience. My first-hand experience is we, my dad was a general contractor. Um, we did a lot of remodeling of homes. So what we would do is we would come into these homes and they'd want their houses repainted or whatever, but they didn't want the wood replaced. They wanted you to sand down 30, 40 years of paint back down to the wood so that you could repaint it so that you didn't have that kind of gross looking repainted wood look. Right. So we would go in there and sand all this stuff down. We'd also repair stuff in the homes and stuff like that. So after the Northridge earthquake, which was massive as we know, a lot of soil and dust and contaminants and everything were coming out of most of these homes that were built in the 50s. Nobody said anything about that. Lots of people went and worked on these homes, made, you know, good money remodeling these homes, fixing, repairing. Including you. Including me. I was working with my dad. And at no point did my dad say, oh, that might be bad. Right. No. Oh. So here, no one, son, no here's one, a standard. No one said anything about no. it. You were, you were taking off the lead paint from the 50s. Yes. Just ripping up the houses. Yeah. With all the uh, gases that were released all over the place. Oh, yeah. And just, here's here's a sander. Here's one of those little tiny masks that you, a dust mask. Have at it, son. Get the work done. Let's do it. So what happened? So um, years later, he, I would say a year and a half ago, uh, we get the call that he's sick. And I was like, ah, it's dad. He's not, you know, just, what's wrong with him? He's just being, you know, a panty waste. That's what they would call it. Um, and the doctor said, no, no, he has a tumor. And I said, a tumor? A brain tumor? They're like, yeah, he has a, a glioblastoma. And it was, when he was diagnosed, it was no, very small. It grew within six months to the size of a baseball in his head. So basically what it did was it, it, it just slowly stopped functions in his body. Not there, in our family, there's no history of any kind of brain tumor, cancers, anything like that, ever. So my family are sitting back going, where did this come from? Did, did, he, did he get into something when he was younger? Because he, he partially grew up in San Antonio near, you know, maybe there was something in San Antonio that was bad. But none of us could figure out. Then I see this story because nobody had it. That, oh, we, we don't know where it came from. It, it happens. So... I see this story on NBC and I go, oh my gosh, we were living near a nuclear reactor and nobody knew about it. Now, I can't say yes or no that it of caused course. this, yeah, but of the proof in all of the letters is what shows he had a rare brain cancer, which was typically caused by radiation exposure. I could have a brain cancer. I don't know yet. It just suddenly appeared when he was 69 years old. So it just sickens me that they, the government did this, and what they told the people was, don't say a word. You're sworn to secrecy. Don't tell your families. Don't tell anybody that this happened. And we have proof here, which NBC4 News has brought out, internal letters from Rocketdyne talking about the pollution that Dr. Group was talking about, the cesium, the tritium. It's leaking into the groundwater. And guess what? Nobody wants to pay for it because the lobbyists have paid off all of the EPA and Energy Commission people to say, oh, well, we cleaned it up. What they did was they took the reactors out, they scarred the site off, and they left. And you now think, people are building houses on top of it. But they're building neighborhoods. There is a huge camp at the base of it 
that 30,000 kids a year go to. And what did they do? Well, we know it's contaminated. We'll just buy some of that land. Dr. They, Group, what do you think about all this? I think it's just a sick <clears throat> cover-up. I mean, you know, it's that's why we're here to try to bring awareness to these kind of things. I, I mean, it's a sad story. I, it's it, very sad. It, it makes me think that how many people and how many kids since the 1950s have died because of this? And how many people are going to be affected and, and sick forever because radiation can just stay in your bodies. I mean, the half-life of some radioactive materials are millions of years. I mean, the tritium alone is 12 years. It attacks the DNA, and it's, it affects you slowly and slowly and slowly and slowly and causes cancer and causes thyroid problems and causes all different kinds of diseases. It's just really sad that... You know, our government, state governments, corporations that just make a ton of money and then put a layer of dirt over it and say, and then sell it to somebody else. Yeah. You know, I'm just hoping that we can create change in the world and, and let people know about these things. And hopefully somebody will invent a way to neutralize radiation you know, a good, effective means to do that because that would save so many lives in the future and now, today. Absolutely, and I, I, think, I think the saddest part is the fact that, you know, it's very sad what happened to your dad, and even if it's unrelated, it's very sad, but period, them not saying anything about the plant being there, about the, uh, the damage that was happening, about the disaster, and then just covering it with dirt and having people build houses on it and sign waivers. That is really, really disturbing. Well, Joe, thank you so much for sharing Thanks. your story. Tell you what, I am blown away at this story. Really, really disturbing stuff. Well, all right, we'll be right back with the rest of the InfoWars nightly news and a report by Joe Biggs. I'm Anthony Gucciardi. Thank you so much. And finally tonight, we're going to look a little bit more at Pope Francis and the latest interview that he has given to LaCroix, newspaper in France, a major newspaper. This is so stunning uh, that it's really hard to believe. I mean, we know that the globalists are moving on every front to overthrow culture, uh, to forcibly uh, mix uncompatible groups of people together to create a balkanized, uh, divided population worldwide. But this is simply incredible. Constantinople was overthrown, the former headquarters uh, of the Christian church by the Muslims, and they forcibly converted the population, men, women, and children, by the sword to Islam. Islam, in its dominant historical form, kills anyone that, that does not submit to it or sells them into slavery, because if you're not a member of the faith, you're subhuman and deserve it. Look at Muslim countries today. They can't even get along with each other. The different factions are constantly killing each other. I have nothing against these people inherently. But the fact that the West, that claims it's the birthplace of liberty and freedom, is inviting this in is cultural suicide. But let's look at the Pope. And this mirrors what imams are saying, mirrors what German ministers are saying. We've played the clips just yesterday where uh, you know, the, the, the German government spokesperson uh, for the Muslims says, you know, we're soon going to take over your women and blonde haired blue eyes is bad. And the Germans clap and, and, and love it. Pope Francis likens Jesus to ISIS, says Muslims and migrants must breed with Europeans. The story's on Infowars.com. These are direct quotes. In a shocking interview, Pope Francis likened Jesus Christ to ISIS and said Muslim migrants must breed with Europeans to counter declining birth rates. So they teach Europeans with regulations and taxes not to have children and say that we're overpopulated and then bring in people who say we're not going to mix with your culture, we're going to dominate it. This is the Pope speaking. Today, I don't think that there is a fear of Islam such as ISIS and its war of conquest which is partly drawn from Islam, he told the French newspaper. 
It is true that the idea of conquest is inherent in the soul of Islam. However, it is also possible to interpret the objective in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus sends his disciples to all nations in terms of the same idea of conquest. No, he said, go out and teach brotherly and sisterly love. Do unto others as you'd have do unto them, and don't be part of big wars. And don't persecute people that don't believe like you. But he's now equating Christianity with Islam. The Pope also said he, quote, dreaded, this is a quote, hearing about the Christian roots of Europe. Oh, it's so horrible. Because to him, they take on a colonialist overtone. So let's demonize Europe more. Well, this is Europe that's being colonized now. And he called on European nations to, quote, integrate Muslim migrants into the continent. When Saudi Arabia won't take one of the refugees that are really jihadis, that failed to invade Syria, failed to take it over. They're being kicked out now through Turkey into Europe by the Russians and others. And they're not going back to Saudi Arabia or Qatar or other countries because they are basically the detritus that's been dumped on Syria, dumped on Turkey, and now dumped on, dumped on Europe. This integration is all the more necessary today, quoting the false pope, since as a result of selfish search for well-being, Europe is experiencing the grave problem of declining birth rate. He stated, a demographic emptiness is developing. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, not only did a lot of the men go become priests, they then became pedophiles. So that's another problem of the dying demographics. His opinions are stunningly similar to those of top imam, Aid, who said Muslims should exploit the migrant crisis to breed with Europeans and conquer their countries. We have all the links in the article because of time. I'm not going to play them here today. Now let's move on. Let's look at other wondrous things that are being brought here to undermine and collapse the nation state. The multinationals have already collapsed the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, Asia, to a great extent. Now they're bringing in the most unskilled, diseased people from Eastern Europe, Middle East, you name it, to further weigh down the country and bankrupt it. That's why the cult M16-223 was developed. I guess they call it 556 now in the Army because the bullet's so small but so fast, it fragments. It doesn't usually kill you but wounds you horribly. And they admitted that that was to get around NATO, not allowing soft point bullets but full metal jacket. And so it's an anti-personnel bullet that maims and causes five or six people to have to take care of them. And that's what Cloward and Piven is, the strategy to bankrupt the economy, bankrupt the country, have people so dependent and, and, and so sick and dumbed down that the whole system collapses. That's how you conquer the nation. Then you come in and change the policies once you've done it. Here's a story out of Breitbart using U.S. government numbers. 22% of resettled refugees in Minnesota test positive for tuberculosis, much of it drug-resistant TB, a death sentence. Uh, continuing, they don't let anybody like that, though, into the Vatican that has 200-foot walls. And then there's another story of the Star Tribune. After 20 years of decline, tuberculosis inches up in the U.S. So we've got to wear spacesuits once we know it's around us, but we don't test the immigrants coming in like we did 100 years ago at Ellis Island. This is a nation, a culture being designed uh, for suicide. And speaking of cultural suicide, we are going to play a short clip of this. Uh, this is a person who admits he's a pedophile. Here's the headline. Salon reports this. I'm a pedophile, but not a monster. The new civil right is to have somebody pay for your sex change. The new civil right is to have somebody pay for your abortion. And he goes on to talk about uh, reports of you know hanging out with a five-year-old uh, girl he's babysitting, uh, and uh, but you know he he he's so virtuous, uh, you know he didn't do anything. It just goes on and on. According to Nickerson, at age 18, he babysit a five-year-old girl who and fell in love with her. Since he never wanted to act on his urges, he chose privately to relieve himself, and it just goes on. They've written scores of articles at Salon the last few years promoting pedophilia, and and selling it like it's just loving. And, and we have government in the U.S. saying, we're going to give your kids inoculations because they consent or abortions because they consent. The age of consent is 18. If you have sex with a 10-year-old or give them drugs, and, and just because they said they wanted to have sex or use drugs, you have raped them or you have drugged them and contributed to the, delinqu the delinquency of a minor. 
you have violated their rights to grow up and develop a free will. And to have the state and the media and others promoting this like it's a good idea is totally, absolutely sickening because if they can get away with promoting pedophilia, they can do anything. Let's play a clip right now. Popular babysitting gig. She was five. Uh, she was a precocious girl. She was advanced for her age. She was also very independent. A lot of my fantasies actually revolve around little girls who are in some way more powerful than I am. Eventually, my attraction became, you know, overwhelming to the point I had to go relieve myself in the bathroom. What we're witnessing here is the absolute mainlining of evil. Because if they can get you to accept ISIS flooding Europe or pedophiles saying they're loving, good, upright people and are virtuous and openly advertise that, the sky is the limit. Now, I've got other articles here that I'll be covering tomorrow on the radio, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., but here's the bottom line. The globalists want to conquer the world, but they know that tyrants have always fallen. So they want to short-circuit common sense and short-circuit the family and any type of fealty where people are territorial and stand up for themselves. We're not being domesticated to enter some wondrous future Star Trek world where we all live in peace and colonize deep space. We're being domesticated like I guess you would cut the legs off a guinea pig and pull the teeth out of a guinea pig you wanted to feed to a prize boa constrictor to make sure it didn't scratch or bite the boa when it was about to eat it. We're being defanged and dehorned so that these cosmic con artists, these cosmic pedophiles, these cosmic pieces of degenerate filth can have their ways with us. We are being farmed. We are being prepared for the dinner table of the globalists, and every ounce of, uh, of my core humanity stands against it. This has been another edition of Teleprompter Free News, produced right here in Austin, Texas. God bless you all. Great job to the crew. Please spread the word about this transmission, because the establishment does not want anybody to be aware of these actual facts we're breaking down. See you back tomorrow. And welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Joe Biggs, and joining me today, former Navy SEAL Carl Higby. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, thanks for having me back on. Hey, uh, so I wanted to talk to you more in depth this time about your book, Enemies Foreign and Domestic, A Seal Story. Um, it starts off with you on the tarmac, and you are actually getting ready to go out on this mission to capture the Butcher of Fallujah. Let's, let's break down from the tarmac on into the uh, actual apprehension of him. Let's get into depth about that if you can. Well, actually, the uh, operation we start off in Enemies Foreign and Domestic was, uh, was not the one we were going to get. Uh, the Butcher of Fallujah, but that was uh, rather on my first deployment. That was back when it was uh, it was actually we were fighting the war to win, and there were, the rules of engagement weren't so restrictive. So it was a little bit different operation. But uh, did you want to go into the operation or the Butcher of Fallujah first? Yeah, let's go into the Butcher of Fallujah first. I think that'd mm -hmm. be a good one. All right. So this guy, uh, everybody knows they've, they've seen American Sniper. Scott McEwen, the author of American Sniper, wrote my foreword to this book, and uh, this guy is featured in that movie as the Butcher. Now. He was a bad dude. We'd been looking for him for quite some time. One of our officers, our SEAL officers, actually found him, which was miraculous. We uh, surveilled him for a little while. We got finally, finally got approval to go get this bad guy because up to that point, our chain of command had been denying us the ability to go get almost any any terrorist we put on the target deck. We found him, went to uh, went to prosecute him. Flawless operation, kicked in the door in the middle of the night. He had a gun on target. The hero of the op, Matt McCabe, was able to subdue him. And uh, without a, a shot fired, because, you know, you never want to fire a shot because it wakes up the whole neighborhood. And now you're in a big gunfight. And so we got him down, uh, not a scratch on him. We bring him back to base, put him in the Connex box, which was our detention facility at the under the supervision of a master at arms, which is an MP, a military police. And he left his post. And during that time, this terrorist, uh, Abed Asham, he bit his lip, as testified by an oral surgeon, spit blood on himself and claimed we abused him. Yeah, that kind of stuff happens. I mean, what's going through your mind, though? I mean, you, you, you get called out. You find out that you're going to be part of this mission, one of the most wanted men in the Middle East at that time. You know, what's going through your mind? What are your emotions? I mean, your, your heart's got to be pumping. You've got to be, you've got to be super excited to be part of something like this, to take out someone who has been killing a lot of people, right? Right, and absolutely. And that was why we actually put a number of, uh, number of attempted operations against this guy in the past, and our chain of command had shot it down. 
And now we were so 100% sure we went above our chain of command and, and submitted this. So it was a great thing to be a part of. I mean, we, we, we as a team, we worked incredibly well together. We prosecuted the target. We brought them back without a shot fired. By all intents and purposes, it was a flawless operation. Well, I want to get more into what we kind of talked to briefly in this first segment earlier uh, about the changing of the military. You know, we have three deaths linked to recent Navy SEAL training classes. And uh, my fear is, is due to this entire PC nature that we, uh, we have right now, the fact that we have a leadership now that is actually following this political correct uh, lifestyle all of a sudden, I have a fear that there's going to end up being a drop in standards in SEAL training, in uh, SF training as far as Green Berets, Rangers, things like that. And that's going to affect our future missions when we try to go out after these bad guys. Because like you said earlier, the enemy doesn't drop their standards, but for some reason, our leadership is having us do this. Now, why do you think some of these deaths are happening? And do you think that it could eventually get to a point where they might start dropping standards for these elite soldiers? Well, there was a phase where they did drop standards in BUDS, and I, I, they've since corrected it for the most part. But what's wrong now is you have a politically correct push within the military, and a lot of good SEALs are getting out. They just can't put up with the rules of engagement anymore. They can't put up with the BS. That's not what they joined for. So they're losing good guys. And Congress and other military leaders have mandated more uh, more SEALs be put in. So what you have is you have, uh, while great men and women, no doubt, uh, they're being pushed into training now that maybe they shouldn't be in. Maybe the screening process has gotten slightly more lenient. Maybe the initial screening process should be more stringent as it was when I went through. It was almost impossible to qualify for these things with all the tests. I mean, if you had flat feet, you couldn't get in. Now they've, they've relaxed, not necessarily the physical standard, but the criteria in order to make the cut. And then what's happening is, is these guys, still great men, women, are going through training, and now they're getting hurt in training. They're getting, you know, and, and there are some statistics that support the opposite of this, but, but, I mean, as you're seeing in the press, guys are dying in training. And the fact is that these people aren't screened as well as they used to be, and they're slipping through the cracks. And the problem is also, once you graduate the program, Sometimes, occasionally, they're getting to the team and they're getting further screened, just like as everybody else has, and they're not making the cut there either. So you're still getting the same number of SEALs to a deployable state. You're just losing far more because of politics. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous when you think about it, how they do that stuff. And I mean, yeah, people are going to die in training because, you know, when I was watching the documentary last night about Navy SEALs, they wanted to get that training as close to combat scenarios as possible. Um, mm -hmm. That way, when you actually have to go and engage in that atmosphere that you would be at that tier one level ready to operate, you know, and, uh, you know, it's unfortunate it does happen, but I want to get your opinion on something else, uh, on something else. Air Force General is first woman at top tier U.S. Combat Command. You know, this has been a big topic uh, across the country the past few weeks. You know, Michael Savage, I've seen it on Fox, other uh, stations as well, where people are concerned about women being put in combat roles and then also without any combat experience, taking these leadership positions as well and leading elite soldiers into these combat missions. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that the issue here is you have a woman now in charge of a combat unit, but women haven't been allowed in combat for long enough for her to have the experience to run a combat operation. So I think that it's putting our troops at a detriment here. And look, you have the don't ask, don't tell policy, which destabilized a large number of people in the military. I mean, if I was commander in chief today, I would not reinstitute the don't ask, don't tell because it would add more instability. But I wouldn't have taken it out in the first place. And that's what you have is this social experiment where everyone's equal and everybody gets their own uh, their own way to do things. You can wear a turban now. Women can be in combat. There'll be seals. The problem is, is you're destabilizing a, a thing where it's where the margins are so razor thin and it's it's just not worth it. I mean, I feel like it's a psych psychological thing. You know, when you have men who have trained their entire lives who have held themselves to that high standard, who have fought day in and day out, you know, beaten their bodies, suppressed their emotions from combat, and to go out here and then to, to almost feel like they're being used, like you said earlier, as they're part of the social experiment, that's got to have a huge psychological toll on these elite soldiers as well. A massive psychological toll. And, and the other thing, too, is the same groups that are advocating for equal women's rights and equal everything, equal everybody, are the same people who are now complaining because they're considering putting women in for the draft. Now, if women are truly equal, why do we have, you know, why do we have different standards? Why do we have um, them not registered for the draft? Why do we have male and female sports team? If everybody's equal, let's just make it all equal across the board. But the fact is, we're not. 
And I know that some feminists out there are going to freak out, but the fact of the matter is some women, most women, are not as strong as most men. And that's just science. It's not like I could physically not birth a baby. You know, that is the reality of it. But the, you cannot start making social experiments out of the one force that is responsible, solely responsible for the entire defense of the United States and our way of life. I mean, what do you think that the enemy is doing right now, sitting over there? Uh, there there's enemy here, obviously, and there's, there's enemies over there overseas as well in the pond over in theater. What do you think they're thinking about us right now when they see uh, men identifying as women so they can go use the women's restroom or a white woman like Rachel Dolezal who identifies as a black female? You know, I think if she can identify as a black female and we can uh, all have to walk around and say that she's a, an African-American, that she should be able to get reparations for slavery. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, if I could say anything to the, those guys overseas laughing at us, I'm a white American that identifies as the person who's going to kick your ass. So uh, <laughs> we can we can put that any way you want. But I, they're laughing at this. I mean, it's disgusting. I mean, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, we could pull up articles, you know, day in and day out where I can't remember what it was. I think it was about eight months ago. There was an article in the Military Times or the Army Times where they showed soldiers in red high heels uh, marching down the road to see what it was like to walk a day in the, you know, in, in, in women's shoes or whatever. You know, ISIS, all these people, communists overseas who hate us, hate our freedom, hate what we represent, hate everything about America, are looking at these articles. They see the same stuff that we're seeing, and they're laughing, and they're sitting there going, all right, this is too easy. Let's plan our next move. And we see, we saw what happened in Paris. We saw what happened in San Bernardino. We know that our southern borders are wide open. We know there's a good chance that there is ISIS already down there. I went down to El Paso and actually crossed over into Juarez and went over to Anapra by myself uh, to investigate some Judicial Watch reports about ISIS training camps. Well, thank you for uh, coming on again once again. Uh, Carl Higby, former Navy SEAL, author of Enemies Foreign and Domestic, a SEAL story, uh, co-author Brandon Caro, who actually wrote his own book, uh, The Old Silk Road. And thanks for joining us tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Joe Biggs. 